Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. We have a special guest today who is our co-host. It happens to be Sir Con Ash, who's been working with us probably by eight or nine years, and he knows our program system very well because he's been the technician in charge. He understands the equipment. He's been able to do wonders in a very modified uh, studio, but we get our program out. Sir Con, good to have you with us today. Uh, it's good to be here, Dr. Paul. It's an honor and a privilege to be doing this with you. Um, and today we're doing Ask Ron Paul. And without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and hop to the first question. Very good. Uh, this is always a fun program. And the first question is from Janice Thompson. You have seen corruption for more years than most. Is there any hope for America? I'm an optimistic person, but I'm cautious when I talk about my optimism. But uh, yes, I, I think there's hope for America because uh, the world has been uh, in a contest between good and evil from the very beginning. And we have our spells up and down, but I'd have to agree with people who can get pretty despondent about what's going on in the world. I mean, what's happened to America? And some of my speeches are very uh, cautionary in how bad things are because I think something major happened a hundred years ago and we've essentially lost our republic and we have perpetual wars and all these things are gone but you no know, I, I think there's hope for america because just think of the uh challenges our founders had they were fighting the british government the biggest biggest army in the world and they they were a ragtag army and they were able to present a cause where they actually won the military battle too so I think the worst thing to do is give up hope and realize that there's a lot of reason for it. But they talk about corruption. The questioner is absolutely right. You go to Washington, you'll run into corruption. But, you know, it's not everybody. You know, I, I keep saying, I look back on my life and, you know, uh, growing up, being in, in even government schools, being in college, being in medical school, being in the military, being in a residency, and all these things, and being in politics. But the majority of people, by large part, have been decent people, and uh, I keep looking at that. Because I think the people in Washington, they gain power. That's the, where the real problem is, and they get influence. And you take a guy like Soros, he's a very dangerous person. He has been able to manipulate the system, accumulate great wealth, and he had a goal of promoting cultural Marxism. And uh, unfortunately, he's been rather successful on it. But what we have to do is realize what is going on, and uh, we have to expand the definition, uh, you know, of corruption. Yeah, there's the old-fashioned corruption of stealing, cheating, and lying, which has gone on a long time. And we had an FBI, uh, a CIA agent say, "Oh, that's what they taught us in school: the lie, cheat, steal, and kill." And so, so that that's there. But I look at it in a bigger uh, area. I, I look at it as the corruption of language, the corruption of politics, uh, the corruption of economic policy. It was really the corruption of economic policy that motivated me to go to go into politics because I wanted to ventilate about the stupidity about our monetary policy. And that was, you know, back in the early 70s with the breakdown of the Bretton Woods. So it was it was that corruption and we're still suffering from it. And the corruption is so bad because it rewards the uh, people who are deceptive and thieves and, and the military industrial complex. All these people get some benefit from, from this. But it, it is corruption. But it's, it's due to a philosophy which is, oh, by the way, I learned that in college. When I was in Washington, I met a lot of people. I remained on talking, uh, you know, friendly status with them just to get more information from them. But it was only about three or four that I thought understood Austrian free market economics and why we don't need a Federal Reserve. Now, most of them were taught in government schools, and that is our problem. That's where the corruption is. It's in the philosophic system.
And we can trace back all our problems to approximately 100 years ago when uh, the progressive movement was developed. That's when we changed our foreign policy, our monetary policy. We ha introduced the income tax. So you, they, you might say, oh, you're too, too pessimistic. It's really bad. Yeah, it really is. But it's also something, it, the numbers are there. It's the uh, whole political system that's bad. This purity in democracy and only manipulating a majority. You can do anything you want to the minority. That's a problem. But I think we're making progress from that. It was a disaster, uh, you know, combating the COVID environment and all the lockdowns. But in a way, we've been winning battles there. But we have to win the battle right now to explain to people why it's stupid for us to be over uh, as, a, as running the NATO to have a war with Russia. Now, that's stupidity, and that is corruption, and that is, they have to expose it. So the answer is exposing the corruption and making sure people are educated in economics as well as a non-interventionist foreign policy. Sir Cotter. Very good, Dr. Paul. I'll just go ahead and go to the next question here. Uh, and that comes from uh, Q Morabi. If Dr. Paul was in charge, how would he end the Ukrainian war? So you're the president, Dr. Paul. How would you stop it? <laughs> I would stop it quickly. And a president can do that. You know, there was one time, I think under Grover Cleveland, the Congress uh, either was on the verge of it or declared war. He says, they might, they might as well not bother because I'm not for the war. And I'm the commander in chief and I'm not going to send the troops because it's a stupid idea of going to war. So, yes, the president is the commander in chief. And, uh, you know, during the presidential campaigns, uh, people would ask me this question because we were trying to get us get ourselves out of the Middle East and the disaster there. I said, well, we just marched in. Why don't we just march out? And it should be as simple as that. Get directive. Maybe more sensibly uh, sensible than they did with you, uh, the Afghanistan. Uh, that it should be as much protection as you can give to the troops. But there's no reason that you can't get in within weeks of months and bring them home and, uh, and just get it over with. But uh, I think there's a better idea. I think, you know, we just marched in. We ought to just march out. But I have a, a suggestion to make for a generation now that's into Washington and running, running the show is don't send them in. It's much easier. Stop, stop the confrontation. It, 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 uh, try diplomacy for a change instead of being followed by the military industrial complex and the, the inflationary cycles that go on. Uh, and there's, there's just no reason for that. We don't need it. We need people to understand what not intervention is all about and not getting involved in, in, in these areas where we do not have any business and uh, it's always done on a pretense. Oh, we have to be in Ukraine where we have to save our constitution we have to save our liberties and we have to pre preserve peace and uh, right now you know the Russians are destroying everything but everybody ignores the information is important everybody seems to ignore the whole fact that in 2014 Ukraine had an elected president that we kicked out. We participated with NATO and others and committed a coup, which has introduced us to this disaster over there from 2014. We spent, oh, $110 billion. And now what do we do? Our president rushes over there. Oh, oh, we'll give you $500 million more. That's insanity and it's stupid and it's following rules of, uh, of just anti-liberty and anti-constitutional, uh, uh, anti-American. And yet too many people go along along with that so there's a reason the minority go along with it because they're accused if they don't that they will be unpatriotic and they don't support the troops and they don't have to listen to that propaganda so I would say if we had the right position if we didn't have a Federal Reserve they couldn't afford to go in we don't need, don't need a Federal Reserve you, if you didn't have the money and there wouldn't be enough taxes by, to be collected by the IRS so the war would stop if uh, if we didn't have the Federal Reserve printing money, debasing the currency, cheating the people out of their wealth, bringing on deliberately welfareism and, and wars and uh, depressions and recessions. 
And they do that deliberately. So it is fallacies. It's the destructiveness of, uh, of the economic system. But, but they say, oh, well, that's, we're not communists and we're not fascists and we're not socialists. We're, you know, moder uh, we're moderates and we want to take care of people. No, what we are putting up with is we're corporatists and we allow our corporations to get into business with the government. So it's a system that is close to fascism, but it isn't because the government gets to do what they want or direct corporations to do with it. And if they come and say to the government, oh, Mr. Government, you're violating our civil liberties. Oh, no, it's the corporations. It's social media that's doing it. But they're friends. They're buddies. They work together and they both benefit from it. So it, it has to be exposed. And I think the numbers would shrink because when we were fighting the stupidity of the lockdown on COVID, uh, you know, it was pretty, pretty, uh, uh, you know, depressing at times. But eventually the majority of American people said, this is crazy. Well, why are we doing this? You can't, you know, take away the First Amendment taking away the license of doctors because they just wanted to talk about natural immunity? No, we've made a big leap, you know, in the right direction, but we still have a long way to go. So no, it can be changed, but what the, the real threat to us is the control of the message, the control of the media, and that is why social media in, in uh, uh, partnerships with the government has been such a threat to it. But we could end the war, but we have to change our philosophy of government and realize that if you're, if, if you're looking at uh, so, uh, uh, democracy and saying, well, it's democratic, the majority want this. Well, that's saying that the minority gets nothing. You get, you get the majority, you pay the majority to come along and endorse the war. And the people who have to fight the war and pay for it, they don't get a say. That's why democracy is so dangerous that uh, it's a, it is a deliberate destruction of minority opinion. And the only way they can maintain it as a country gets poorer is to, is, uh, is to do that by silencing people. And that's what we're witnessing now. We should concentrate on freeing up the people. Then we could. We could, uh, if we had marched in, we could just march out, but maybe we'll quit marching in. It'll be a lot easier for all of us. Sarkhan. Very good, sir. Um, so if anybody, all of our uh, fans and subscribers, if they haven't seen your war rally speech, that is on our uh, Rumble site. Uh, please watch that. You were incredible, sir. And then we're going to the, to the hard questions now. And then the first question comes from uh, Miley Mixon, what can be done to loosen the grip on the military industrial complex on this country? The warmongers seem to have all the power, making billions and trillions at the expense of taxpayers, taking us closer and closer to World War III. How do we stop them, Dr. Paul? Well, what we could do is get people who aren't interested. You know, the founder said the Constitution is pretty darn good. We've done our best, but it's not going to work if the people don't have some moral standards. And, uh, and we had better standards at one time. You'll never have perfection, obviously. But uh, now it's become more immoral. And uh, we have a contest going on because I believe the Republic has been uh, usurped by a coup. And the coup occurred back in the progressive era. And that is why we have the income tax and, and the Federal Reserve and the spending and, and the deficits all. So we have this coup, a takeover, and uh, I call that Soros, uh, Sorosism, Sorosism, because he's the one that has done amazing things in showing how he can be corrupting, make money in a free market system, and then influence so many elections. So that is a job. So we have that to contend with, and uh, we have uh, a coup where the, he and his helpers and workers in the social media uh, have been able to take over so many industries, like education system. That's a big one. Taking over medical system now. Taking over the military industrial complex. That's another big group. Taking over the pharmaceuticals. Taking over the medical profession. I mean, that has to stop or, or we can't survive. But uh, I, I think most people just don't realize that. But the enemy really is what has replaced this whole thing of, uh, uh, as a con and in contest with, this, with the coup that really runs the world because uh, people, uh, the, the, the people who are opposing it, I call them nihilists. 
they, they literally say, you can't know the truth. There's no such thing as truth. Uh, it's, it's the government. It's the political parties. They are the ones that define truth. And that's why you still hear uh, the nonsense coming from government, from our officials. And uh, since you don't know truth, they don't believe in a higher law. They don't believe in natural law. They don't believe in natural immunity. All this nonsense. Everything becomes relative. And that, that to me is where the real problem is, is recognizing who, where the battle, battle is. And this social, <coughs> so, social Marxism is real and uh, it should be realized. And uh, right now, the, the, since our conditions are getting worse, the challenge gets great because the people who have really taken over and really run the country now, they will not go away quietly. But they're going bankrupt. They're not going to be able to finance the wars. The welfare state is going to be in dire straits and uh, chaos will break out. Matter of fact, the Marxists uh, and uh, the corporatists, they want chaos. A lot of times people say, why are they doing this? It's making, look at the violence on the streets and look at what's happening to us. But that's what they want. Out of chaos, they want to give us the real Marxist state. The last one, which was strictly economic, we have to have a, we have to have a social Marxist state as a culture. We have to control everything, plus the economics. So it is a battle of ideas right now. It's whether or not, I think it really boils down to whether or not people have an understanding or any interest at all about a natural law and uh, why, why good and evil still is known about and uh, once it's given up and say you can't know it there is no such thing as truth well what do you get you get a, a, a vacuum and then somebody fulfills it and then the evil fill, fills it so it's it's understandable I think uh, we've had enough experience I see so many positive things I see the positive things uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of happening around the country. I feel good about meeting people that in the last 10 years or so have joined, uh, you know, the freedom movement. And we had such a wonderful meeting up, uh, uh, up in Washington the other day, uh, getting thousands of people out uh, trying to do my, uh, what I have suggested try to prevent us from doing things. And the, the whole part of the, the rally was let's, let's quit sending more, those troops to, uh, uh, to Ukraine. Of course, our troops aren't there, but our NATO's there. Ukraine's our armed forces. It's, it's us that uh, promotes it. There could be, there would be no war in Ukraine without us because we orchestrated that coup in 2014. So, but I see a lot of positive things. One thing I'm very positive of is if you want good economic policy, one has to look at Austrian free market economics. You have to recognize it's based on the principle of voluntarism, no force or violence. And uh, you, you're supposed to apply that to interpersonal relationships, business relationships, and international relationship. Everything has to be voluntary. So if two people, you know, voluntary get together and agree even if it even if they're agreeing to something you might disagree with as long as you have two uh, the whole world would be better off so I want to just go ahead uh, sir Khan and, and close the program by being as optimistic as I can but also being very much aware of how dangerous it is but I believe that over a period of time that I've convinced the answers are out there I think the ideas of uh, liberty the ideas of economic economic policy as good as the founders were uh, they were a long way from uh, understanding the complete picture of Austrian economics but they understand the uh, the uh, basics of what natural law is all about because there is such a thing as good and evil and if you say well you don't know good and you can't possibly know it what happens we get a lot of evil but I think our numbers if you had a real vote and a real polling uh, done in this country. I believe the people who believe in true liberty and true free markets and, uh, and, and, my, and for us in the foreign policy, mind our own business. I believe we would be better off, we would be safer, and the world would be better off. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today uh, to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.